Last semester, I was discussing with my students a now common trend amongst young adults in our country, a phenomenon that is not unique to our country but also global, what I call the productive existential crisis. Many people grow up with such brilliant hopes, dreams and aspirations. Somewhere in their journey, they are this vital hope is relegated by harsh realities of unfulfilled dreams, unrealized expectations, and most importantly, cannibalizing systems of education, society, politics, and economy, sometimes even culture. Most of them shared with me their frustrations, hopes, fears, and uncensored thoughts that they struggled with in life. I was overwhelmed because this, ideally, represented me in totality. I was them even though they did not know that until I humanized myself at the end of the class, much to their warm reception and admiration. I'll be honest, I have not been very lucky with an employment, but I remain steadfast in my quest to break through, for I am deeply aware of the responsibilities on my shoulders, the promise of my potential, and the significance of my dreams as I hope to actualize and make my worthy contribution to life. My family looks up to me. My friends and strangers have contributed immensely to support me through these, these years, especially during my cancer journey. I am a gifted individual at finally accepting that. I know I should create tremendous positive contribution to the world and my community. I have a huge debt to pay, at least morally. Now, the burgeoning scholarship over the past several decades documenting youth stalled in their quest for adulthood, the scholarship on waiting, what I call it, on restless underemployed laborers buying time in the informal sector or economy, on the crisis of African masculinities, on the accumulating material and psychic pressures of unmet familial and community responsibilities. All these are ways of depicting the failure best contextualized within the patriarchal promise of colonial civilizing missions, the breadwinning wage. In this think piece, I seek to explore how socioeconomic forces, particularly to the post-colonial African city, induces a permanent state of pressure among young men at the interrupted point of social becoming. Observing that the crisis of work is also a crisis of sanctity and civility and even dignity, like most scholars like Wendy and Joya would very well put, I historicize the pressures of late capitalism in African cities, namely surviving in informal or gig economies, which the fragment of the wage economy is constituted. I show how the introduction of wage labor during European colonial rule produced at its outset an overwhelmingly unachievable breadwinner norm, particularly for the male. A salary was both an entitlement and a source of intense pressure as it produced a novel form of patriarchal privilege, but also the social and the domestic responsibilities that came to collapse livelihood with this exceptional and exceptionally rare form of economic activity. Examining these pressures within the long shadow of colonialism critically illuminates the role of race making and racial difference in the emergence of financial expectation and deeply personalized societal failure among contemporary urban African youth. My focus will be on men today, mostly. From these racialized and gendered consequences, I situate the unmet aspiration to become a breadwinner under the dual frameworks of racial capitalism and the political economy of patriarchy. Racial capitalism reframes the pressures young African men face in the city as long continuous crises spanning the new social value that emerged out of colonial conquest to loop-sided formal or informal economic divide that has become ever more apparent in the decades since structural adjustment. The political economy further reveals the politics of gender as it links the expectations of breadwinning at the intimate realm of social becoming and social reproduction to post-colonial citizenship and ongoing inequalities of global becoming or belonging. Social pressures 
beget economic pressures and vice versa. To advance this framework, I examine a fixture of social and economic transformations whose manifestation in human form was used in the colonial project to denote Africans who approximated a European civilizational ideal. Men, at least incorporated into the imperial economy as nyaparas of the colonial state, as well as the first salaried urban professionals. I was joking to them if we knew uncles, most of them I think are now their grandfathers or our grandfathers, who first got their jobs in the railway sector, in European white offices. Yes, this kind of people. They were like the indirect rule in British Africa or the assimilation in Portuguese and Francophone Africa. These intermediaries attained a select status and were conferred special rights and entitlements vis-a-vis -vis the colonial regime and over their fellow African subjects. Like access to higher education and military service, the salaried work associated with this privilege was restricted to men according to the division of a masculine public and a feminine private constitutive of the industrializing of a certain ideological order. Now, this gendered bifurcation demonstrates how economic anticipation begets profound social pressures for majority of contemporary urban African men. The colonial statue, like most of our presidents and political leaders, is an iconic figure standing hesitant at attention, yet he appears to wait a command from his superiors. Sometimes you look at our leaders from what comes from their mouth, and you do realize they are prompted by something external to them. He is African, but conducts as the white man, believing himself superior to those he leads. Traditionally consumed in a crisp suit, in a cunning eloquence, his attire and accessories change depending on his hoodwink profession, the politician. Sometimes he holds a briefcase or a book, other times a camera or a doctor's stethoscope hanging around his neck. All signify this man embodies one of the new European trades imported during colonial conquest. These trades would secure masculine dominance in the imaginary of the civilizing mission and minds of those African men initially poised to become its midwife and upon independence, its inheritors. Now, I jokingly challenged my students to rethink when, why, when growing up, a thief was painted in a certain rough, rugged and uncouth image and mannerism, yet today, they are in expensive suits, smelling exotic perfume and living in sub-urban, thriving neighborhoods and driving status symbol vehicles. They typically represent our aspirations. We love them so much that we elect them to govern and police us. Our killers are no longer on our clothes, but skin deep inside us. In addition to regime proximity, what set these trades apart were the salaries they bestowed. Soon after conquest, the salary had become a vehicle that would render men desirable partners, thus transforming what was commonly the African pre-colonial prerequisite for adult masculinity, marriage, into the colonial producer-provider role of a breadwinner. In other words, by enabling breadwinner masculinity, the salary came to mediate between African and the European criteria for manhood. The former as husband, the latter as worker or laborer. To be recognized as a social elder, African men now experienced the financial pressure to participate in the wage economy. This embodied fantasies, projections, and interests that were simultaneously new sources of social and economic pressures, orienting the internal and external dimensions of modern manhood towards an imported colonial ideal. Now, as typical across post-colonial Africa, the modern realm of wage labor was moreover specialized as an urban identity and therefore also categorized as kibarua or city work. At the axis of this novel ideological framework, material conditions and spatial distinctions were expectations of modernity configured by breadwinner masculinity. According and aspiring to 
achieving or failing at breadwinning structured the hierarchies of social pressures of capitalism and the political economy of the African city. The state granted means of livelihood to all it had put under obligation. The salary was the boundary marker between civilization and backwardness. The domain of the salary was to compose what could be made legible to the state and rendered, and rendered equivalent to the standards of world market. On the individual level, it was to enable modern consumer citizenship and social reproduction. It kind of made me think that currently there's a program, there's a thought, there's a policy thought of organizing the border border people into an outfit and then taxing them. You see how this is folding up? Now, its exterior, peddling vegetables and food preparation in the market or petty commerce, for example, generally all that was labor without a salary, consisted of activities that the colonial regime had neither easily captured nor fully understood. Now, going forward, when colonialism gave way to independence, the unruly autonomy of the latter continued to be derided and excluded from the developmental stage modernizing vision and its image of a modern man. Thus arose the new social order, on top of which stood a minority of breadwinning men formerly linked to a state and economy. This is what we call the old money. On the bottom was a majority of unmarriageable men. The pressures to conform to this idealized modern man are now immense, and the social and political stakes for doing so are very severe. Now, it reminded me that Franz Fanon famously wrote that, in quotes, in the, in the colonies, the economic substructure is also the superstructure. The cause is the consequence. You are rich because you're white. You're white because you're rich. Now, to this one, I could add that in the new wage economy, you had money because you are a man. And you are, real, you are a real man if you had money. This introduced a set of pressures in modern life along the axis of access to money or not. The expectations therefore constitute the base measure of masculine identity. However, earning demarcates a life of pleasure at the end of the paycheck from one living day to day condemned to a cycle of pressure. And yet, still, there remained the lumpen majority which salaried work only ever available to a privileged few. Just as it was incompatible with the vision of the modern state, work that fell outside of this exclusive category has been rendered incompatible with modern identity and measure of success. This was work in the informal economy and far from a new phenomenon when Keith Hart coined the term in his research in Ghana in the early 1970s. What was the colonial economy became the formal economy when African states gained their independence. Thus, while the adjustment economies surely reflects the contraction of civil service, civil service employment, a sector which disproportionately constituted the formal economy as a consequence of the private sector, the reality of the daily hassle means one thing. To be a man is not a one-day job. On the heels of economic contraction, women without salaries certainly also face intense economic pressures to provide for themselves and their children. It is not, however, the femi their femininity that is at stake. That is the major difference. Now, the civilizing mission sought to bind modern manhood as a source of value and dignity. We might conclude that this has emerged at the intersection of race of race, capitalism, and political economy of the patriarchy, like a register of inclusion and exclusion. It's kind of like a distinct part in between there. Now, as such, the man signifies the dual colonial legacies that were infused in the ideas of labor and manhood. In contemporary sensibilities around formal and informal work, we find this persistent relevance identifying in this gendered social architecture of the new economic order 
This is a cultural artifact of racial colonial capitalism and the enduring pressures of breadwinning masculinity. When we hear about pressure, we might at first think of a condition of limited temporality under otherwise normal circumstances or an extreme or abject state of abnormality like crisis. Pressure invokes a suspension of life-sustaining and life-thriving conditions experienced in certain peripheral spaces and places by a certain marginalized people. After all, to live under a permanent state of pressure should be unsustainable and by no means normal. And yet, as becomes apparent from examining the breadwinning wage in the long shadow of colonialism, the pressure deriving from the intense uncertainties of making ends meet on a day-to-day -day basis is both common and enduring. How then might we value as measured within the household unit and community and the policy alike be alternatively affirmed by work that reflects the structure of the urban African economy as it is and not as it was imagined first in the civilizing mission and later in the developmental project. How might, how might manhood be affirmed differently by care work, for example, as much as by remunerated work? In seeking to answer these questions, it becomes clear that alleviating this unbearable pressure is about more than creating a more robust formal economy. Rather, it requires a total re-evaluation, perhaps a delinking of the manhood salary breadwinning triad. It got me thinking that a lot of men are deep under the avalanche of searching. I get a lot of young people younger than me reaching out for mentorship. They ask me, how have you made it? How do you keep afloat? What's your secret? Sometimes there are answers. And many times we work through them together. They are my students. Some of them are people I meet online. Others are meeting workshops or spaces that allow us to meet. It is incredibly getting difficult to be a young person. It's almost criminal. And it's worsening day by day. The future seems very bleak for a lot of people. Not just only for young men. For young women. For a future to come behind us. And I don't know whether the older generation are seeing this because they are also perpetrators of this same pressure. Older generations lived in conformity, never questioned much. Life worked for them that way. Until a point came when we had to speak our voices. But it came with a cost. Many young people go back home to questions. When will you ever be useful? When will you marry? When will you have a child? And our self-awareness has gone to the dogs. Most times we do not know what to do with ourselves. It is easier, as I've seen it, a lot of women are doing a lot of advocacy and community cell projects that brings women together. But there's very little that men are doing in terms of doing the same. Most men are sitting behind and waiting to contrast and critique the efforts that a lot of women are now doing. It's about time that we deviate slightly or even off completely from the gender binarism to rethink our society, to reevaluate our pathways, to not see this thing as a war between genders. Because in part, we are alive in this universe at this exact point because we play our parts together. If one part does not play its part, it ripples to every other aspect of life. And you might feel safe that you're doing your work. You might feel safe that things are working for you. You might feel safe that you're unwell or you have the means to achieve whatever it is you want to achieve with your dreams. But we cannot sit back. We have no such luxury. 
I don't know whether this is a call to action, but it is something to ponder about. This is Proof of Life. My name is Omondi Chuka and adios. Bye.